think that it's good for everyone. Remember that this is a safe environment. Make sure that you are doing it, that it will be an inclusive conversation, um, but put it in there so that we can always, always ask. Okay. In the meantime, I'm going to introduce two amazing, amazing poets. Um, first off is Maggie Smith. She is an award-winning author of Good Bones and Well Speaks of Its Own. Um, of its own poison, sorry, <laughs> and land of the body. Um, the and she is also the person who wrote the national bestseller, Keep Moving, Notes on Loss, Creativity and Change. Um, she has won many, many awards. She has also become a um, fellowship winner of the National Endowment of the Arts. She has gotten a push cart prize and she has become another fellowship of the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. Sorry, I think that that was in chronicle order, um, chronological order there. So she has been widely published also within the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Paris Review, and the best American poetry. If you wanna follow her, her information is on the event page during before, and so you can get some of her social media tags there. On the other side of this is going to be Taylor Molly. He is going to be in conversation with her, and he is a four-time National Poetry Slam champion. He is the author of six books, including Life, Fate, and Other Poems, and he is the inventor of these fancy dice. He has them on his shelf behind him, so he might talk about them for a moment, but it's called Metaphor Dice, which is a game that helps writers um, write more figuratively. Alrighty, so I'm going to turn it over to them. I hope you guys have a lovely night. Once again, for the people who joined late, put your questions in the Q&A box throughout the event and so that Taylor can hop into there and pull one out as he wants. Thank you so much, bye. Thank you so much, Hannah. As uh, Maggie and I come on screen, you can probably just hear my voice uh, first, but uh, perhaps, we're, perhaps we're live. Maggie, it's so nice to see you, welcome. Oh, thanks, sir. Thanks for being here and being my partner in crime. Uh, this is wonderful. Congratulations on the book. It came out yesterday. Uh, as I was promoting this, I wanted to say, hey, tune in for my discussion, which will be the first discussion with Maggie after her book comes out, which is technically true. All right. I want to just um, to, uh, wax poetical about you for just a little bit. Sitting in front of Maggie Smith to help the celebrate the publication of her new book, Goldenrod, I am reminded that poetry can be defined as the artful observations of the evermore observant. And it seems to me that Maggie Smith embodies this definition of poetry better than anyone since perhaps Mary Oliver or W.S. Merwin. So permit me to break down that definition, the artful observations of the evermore observant as it relates to Maggie Smith and her fourth book of poetry, Goldenrod. One, artful is an adjective that has two meanings. It means either artistic, beautiful, literally full of art, or else it means sly, mischievous, and good at evading. If you think about it, crafty is another such word. It's macaroni and it's popsicle sticks, but it's also sneaky and subversive. And the poems in Goldenrod are both of those things. Two, observation can mean either the act of observing, especially with the purpose of evaluation or improvement. Any teacher who's had an observation knows this. It can also mean a comment or remark or reflection offered after such a period of observation. An observation is more useful if it is offered after a period of observation. And Maggie Smith's poems are both of those kinds of observations. Observant also has two definitions. It means keen-eyed and vigilant, as well as pious or mindful of important rituals. And Maggie Smith is absolutely both of these things. You come away from many of the poems in Goldenrod suspecting that Maggie Smith is the high priestess in a church you did not know you belonged to as well. And lastly, evermore. The word that precedes observant in my definition of poetry implies that the act of writing poetry actually hones and deepens one's ability to do it in the future, like a paper cutter with a self-sharpening blade. And this 
most of all brings me to the particular Maggie Smith, who is the author of this book. Reading Goldenrod makes me feel as though I am in the capable hands of someone who, in addition to being an Ohio native, a best-selling and award-winning author, and the 40-something divorced mother of two, has learned by heart the lessons that life and poetry have taught her or else is doing her very best, as if the act of writing poetry, poetry has made her ever more observant. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Maggie Smith to tell me whether any of this makes sense. Goodness, Taylor, it makes perfect sense. I don't, I don't know that I have the right to claim any of that, but I loved it. Thank you. You're so welcome. Uh, and you and you mentioned to me in one of our you and I have never met face to face, but we've no. traded we've traded some FaceTime chats and and uh, um, texts and uh, and and poetry for you is all about noticing and, and observation, you said. So yeah, I mean, that's and, and really this book, I think, in particular is really focused on on that on that paying attention. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah we'll just we'll talk about it. Okay. All will. right. Do you have the, do you have the present that I sent to you uh, last week? <laughs> yeah. All right. I I love to wrap things. Would you open it up, please? Okay. <laughs> do it. Do it close to your microphone so that we can hear it. Okay. Can you hear the wrapping paper? Yes, we can. Okay. This is a little uh, something. Yes, that is a <laughs> Brooklyn Brewery resin double IPA. Okay. Would you like to take a sip? I would. Okay, well then in that case, I have one too, and I will also open mine. I brought a pint glass because you were- I have a pint it. glass as well. We must be distant cousins. This is uh, apparently a party. Well, I've never met you in person, but now I get to say that I've had, a, oh yeah, I've had a beer with her. <laughs> Cheers to you. Cheers. You did a hard pour on that IPA, Taylor. What's a hard pour? A hard pour. You just dumped it in. You got to do the. Tip. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I, I think I, I'm a little nervous, and I wanted a drink to steady my nerves. Poured it like a nitro stout. That is an amateur move. <laughs> Isn't that good? <laughs> I'm somebody, just observing here. Somebody already else says, "I love the fact that he sent you a gift." All right, Maggie. <clears throat> yes. Since events like this never get to the actual poems soon enough, especially when the host insists on bloviating about his own definition of poetry and how you fit it. Um, could you start us off by reading not the title poem of Goldenrod, which we will get to, but the first poem in the book called This Sort of Thing Happens All the Time. I would be happy to. I love that there, there are requests and a set list. This is great. Um, yes, this is the first, uh, not the title poem, but the first poem in the book. This sort of thing happens all the time. You think you've memorized the calls of North American birds, particularly in the East, but one night you hear a call like a whistle. Someone is not blowing hard enough. The ball inside just rattling, rolling. You see a forested mountain and dusk is suddenly thick with words as if you could hover your cursor above the pastiche of greens and see each name pop up, juniper, citrine, celadon, hunter, fern. I'd say only in a dream, but doesn't this sort of thing happen all the time? One night you find yourself on a dark street in the suburbs with air that smells like cut grass, jungle, myrtle, viridian, spring, and laundry steam. You're standing too close to a lit house, which could be yours. Is it yours? And through blue windows, you watch the evening news. The anchor's mouth is moving, but outside you hear only crickets in the cold, dewy lawn. Crickets and that broken sounding bird. Then one dog barking, then two. You're a really good reader. I'm just gonna say that right now. Practice. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. I've got three follow-up questions to it. I'm going to ask them all in a row and you answer okay. whichever ones you want or okay. remember. Okay. Did you ever find out the name of the bird with the broken whistle? Why did you choose? And I'm, I'm going to 
this is already one of the questions that somebody put in the Q and A. Why did you choose this poem to be the first one instead of Goldenrod, which is the second? And <clears throat> did you know that there are several apps such as Smart Plant, Leaf Snap, and Plantifier, which allow you to, in your words, almost hover your smartphone over the pastiche of green and see the names pop up? Um. Answer one, no, I don't know what kind of bird it was. Although there are apps that you can, um, you know, sort of try to identify bird sounds. And I'm becoming, I'm becoming wise to those, but not when I wrote this poem. Um, two, I did not know that app existed. So There's that's like three or four of them. You, you, you hover it over the leaf and boop, it'll tell you, yep, yeah, that's, that's goldenrod. That's, that's this, that's that's crazy. And the, the names pop up. It's amazing. I love that. I love that there's plant identifying software that you could carry on a tiny computer in your yes. doing everything device. That you do. Yeah. I love that. And the, the other question um, I can kind of answer is why is this poem first? Um, and it's because it won over all the other poems to get top billing. I mean, when I'm when I'm putting together a, a book of poems, I really just print everything out and then I start to do like a like literal hard copy shuffle. Yeah. And I'm just looking at how like how do I want to welcome? What do I want the first impression to be tonally and imagistically? What do I want the welcome to be for that particular book? And then once I once I go through every single poem, and sometimes there are a few that are contenders, um, and then I figure out which one feels right as first, then I look at that tone and the imagery in that poem and, and primarily the way it ends. Like, how do we leave? How do we exit that poem? And then I start looking at, okay, what poem could follow that one? So if the last lines say this, or the last move, does this work? or the tone feels like this, what could follow it? And so it, it's kind of like um, making a mixtape in a way, or I guess now a playlist, um, where you have to kind of think about the seams between the songs. And, and to me, putting together a book of poems is always like that. So Goldenrod could have been first. It could have, the book could have started with the words, I'm no botanist. And actually for a book called Goldenrod, that would have been sort of funny. Um, but I liked, I liked this poem first because it felt kind of like a quiet, unsuspecting um, front runner. Like I, I liked, I liked letting him get top billing. Your poem is th that's a boy. That poem. I don't know. Maybe yeah. I mean, there's okay. a new anchor in it. I think of that guy as as being a guy. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, speaking of, uh, I'm no botanist. For someone who claims in the title poem of her of her book, I'm no to be no botanist, you sure do seem to know a lot about plants and birds. By any chance, is your next book going to be called Cardinal and have a poem that begins with the line, I'm no ornithologist? Uh, no, although that is the uh, state bird of Ohio where I live. That's why I chose it. Um, genius. Yeah, I'm not an ornithologist. Um, I, I have Is over the years been drafting a poem about not being a birder because really birders know things and carry binoculars. And I just sort of look with my naked eye. In, in a, you know, the, the, so many of these poems are a celebration of incomplete uh, knowledge. Mm. And, um, uh, it, and I'm wondering whether you begin a line with, I'm no, uh, you're a poem with, I'm no botanist. As a, do, do you know the, the rhetorical device prolepsis? Um, something is proleptic if you admit to a fault that you have not yet been accused of. And it's a way by putting it right in the first line, I'm no botanist, then you can, then you can pretend to be a botanist and everybody knows you're not trying to be one because you already said you weren't one. You're giving yourself a little wiggle room. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm going to fall flat on my face here, but bear with me. Well, it's like, I love it when anybody ever says, um, uh, this is going to come out wrong, but I'm just going to say it anyway. And then like, they're very eloquent. Go they ahead and fall flat on your face. Right, right. right. All right. Um, the poem, this is a question you, you've probably never gotten a question like this. The poem Goldenrod fits perfectly on one page. If it were even one line longer, 
that line would have to be bumped to the next page. In fact, by my count, there are five such poems that just barely fit on one page. Goldenrod, which is 14 lines, Wild, which is 14 lines, two of the poems that have the same title, Ohio Cento, uh, one is 14, one is 15, and then Talisman, which is 20 lines. Is any one of those poems responsible for the adorable size of the entire <laughs> book or the font size of every poem? In other words, did you ever say to your editor, Julia Chaffetz, um, or the interior designer, I don't care what it does to all the other poems in this book. I need this poem to fit entirely on one page. Or do you think you, or follow up question, do you think you write poems in a certain length? Um, the first thing I'll say is I do tend to write poems in a certain length. I'm very comfortable. When you started naming the line lengths, I felt like a little guilty and called out because I'm very comfortable with a sonnet length poem, which would be 14 lines. Um, if I get to a second page in a word doc, I am patting myself on the back because I tend to whittle as I revise and my poems shrink as they grow. Um, so it's, it's hard for me sometimes to write a longer poem. The trick to the trim size of this book, and I'm gonna blow your mind here, It's exactly the same size as my last book. <laughs> uh, so are, that's, that's great. So you can fit them in the same box if you're sending somebody a box. Yep, so it's, that's, that's where the trim size came from. But I love, um, I love, Dana Levin was like, it's hand sized. And I thought that was so genius because it really does feel good. It's an easy size book to slip into like yeah. a small bag um, or a large pocket which I think, you know, that's what I like to do with, with books of poems. I like to carry them around with me and, and I don't mind carrying a large tote, but this makes that um, not necessary. Right. And the, the texture, the matte texture, uh, and even the raised, um, my wife is in publishing and she'd be able to, the, the, that embossed writing, just the haptics, the haptics of the, of the book are, are gorgeous. It's beautiful. They did such a lovely job. Please read the poem, During Lockdown, I Let the Dog Sleep in My Bed Again. I can help you find it. I should have written down the name. I think I know. It's near the end. I love this poem. It's near the end. I can find it. OK. During lockdown, I let the dog sleep in my bed again. Last night, my daughter cried at bedtime of loneliness, she said. She's seen the graph, the jagged mountain we need to press into a meadow. And maybe she pictures the drive home from Southern Ohio, how the green hills flatten without us doing a damn thing, no sacrifice required. I tell her the steep peak makes loneliness our work, makes an honorable task of it. But I shut myself in the bathroom and cry hard into a hand towel. I walk alone in the snow, squinting up into the big wet flakes, letting them bathe my face. I tell myself it is a kind of touch. I tell myself it will do. Mm. I edited the dog out of this poem. Well, that's that's part of what my next follow up question is. <laughs> uh, but first, I want to ask you, did you did you manage to see the reading of this poem that I did on social media last week? I did, and you said you changed a word, but I, I didn't notice, so. I, I didn't, I well then that means I did, I did it right. Um, when, I, when I say, when, I, uh, when I'm you talking to your daughter, uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a lot more, uh, you know, I tell her the steep peak makes loneliness our task. I'm sorry if I'm not getting uh -huh. it right. And, and I changed, um, uh, you have but, but, I go, but I, but, but later I cry. And I changed it to, then I cry hard into it. The way I read it, the way I read it, it just made it flow better. And I hope you didn't mind. <laughs> um, here are my questions. 
To me, the theme I mentioned earlier of celebrating incomplete understanding is fully present in this poem. And my heart goes out to its persona, especially since she doesn't even get to be comforted by the dog that is mentioned in the title, but doesn't actually appear anywhere in the poem, at least in the final draft. My question is this, in the final lines of the poem, where the persona walks alone in the snow and lets the big wet flakes bathe her face, telling herself it is a kind of touch and that it will do. Is she closing her eyes and imagining that the snow is saying, to quote your poem, Bride, darling, I have waited for you all my life. Oh, I love thinking of those, those two poems being in conversation. Well, I ju it just seems like the, you know, with with the, the letting the dog sleep in her bed again, although not. the dog's been edited, sort of not, you know, you know, and saying, I tell myself, this is a kind of touch. You know, is she, there's a, uh, you know, it's that, it's that reverence for nature that Merwin and Oliver have. And I can imagine her saying, you know, I, gosh, I would love to be touched like this. You know, let me be the bride of snow, which is the name of bride my of snow. Book. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, in the earlier drafts of this poem, the dog comes back at the end. I come back from the walk and crawl into bed with a dog who has been kicked out of the bed because she snores and kicks. But I would rather have the snoring, kicking dog. Right. Than nothing because it was right. such a lonely time. And so... Um, the dog did sleep in the bed. I just edited that part out of the poem because I felt like it was enough to have it in the title. And I liked the idea of that suggestion being a placeholder, but not actually doing the tidy thing of right. like wrapping no, no, no. Yeah. up, book ending it in that way. I love, I love the permission that you gave yourself not to have the dog appear. Uh, I, I find myself, I'm a spoken word poet, but I find myself titling my poems too often like with the, the last line. Yep. And then you yeah. steal the thunder from yourself because you've actually like, you've given it all away up front. Except that in the poetry slam, I'm gonna ask you about that later. In the poetry slam, Different. you you rarely get to say the title of the poem. So you wouldn't be stealing the thunder. Got uh, it. All right, but that's, uh, that's not, we're not there yet. Um, there, are, there, there are two people have requested that you read the poem written dear. So oh. while, while you find that, I have one more follow-up question to during lockdown, I let the dog sleep in my bed again. Do you live in the kind of place where you can go for a walk alone in the snow after you've put your children to sleep or were you just in the backyard? Um, it was probably a, a no, I do not do that. Um, I could, but I don't. Um, and it was probably a night when they were at their dad's. Got it, okay. Yeah, um, I mean, I do walk a lot um, at night in my neighborhood and it's a perfectly safe neighborhood. And actually, I, you know, at six o'clock at night in the winter time, I take that back. The sun sets here so early that after dinner, the kids can be here watching, you know, a nature show after dinner and I can go take the dog for a walk, lock them in the house, take my phone with me, walk one turn around the block and be back five minutes later. And Got yes, it. I do live in that kind of maybe neighborhood. <laughs> All right, read us written dear. And uh, okay. Amy, Amy Richards wants to know about uh, the, the epic, why, the, talk to me about the epigraph from Wislawa Zimborska uh, oh. whenever you want. Well, I mean, the epigraph is uh, why does this written dough bound through these written woods? And it was the inspiration for the poem. So um, I read that line and thought, got the image in my mind of this sort of landscape made out of language. And that is the metaphor of that is what led me into the poem in the first place. So a lot of times I, um, I drop epigraphs later, sort of like I dropped the dog from the end of that last poem. A lot of times an epigraph might be the sort of engine that gets me the momentum to get into a poem, but then it becomes sort of like a vestigial tail. Like at the end of the poem, it's gone in this other direction. And in yeah. fact, the epigraph isn't really needed and it's kind of clunky and, and, is, and is more in the way than it's useful. But right. this it's was not an epigraph, it was, it was in retrospect, it was a prompt. Yep, it was a prompt. Yeah. This was the whole genesis, and it did, the the I felt like it would be disingenuous to remove the epigraph because her words are what got me there. Okay. So, this is Ladies written, and gentlemen, here. written dear by Maggie Smith. 
My handwriting is all over these woods. No, my handwriting is these woods. Each tree a half print, half cursive scrawl, each loop a limb. My house is somewhere here and I have scribbled myself inside it. What is home but a book we write, then read again and again, each time dog earing different pages. In the morning I wake in time to pencil the sun high. How fragile it is, the world. I almost wrote the word, but caught myself. Either one could be erased. In these written woods, branches smudge around me whenever I take a deep breath. Still, written fawns lie in the written sunlight that dapples their backs. What is home but a passage? I'm writing and underlining every time I read it. Mm. That's great. I'm slightly distracted by somebody who asks, when you go for a walk around the block and bring your phone, it's not the turquoise phone that you have behind you on the windowsill, no, is it? <laughs> that's the phone that my children can call me on when oh, I there you go. this Perfect. one with me if there's an emergency. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna power through these questions and get and and get to as many of the uh, other people's questions as 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 I can. The book is divided into three sections of exactly eighteen poems each, which I didn't notice at first, but now I think seems deliberate because so many of the individual poems demonstrate a controlled respect for symmetry and pattern. The use of the number eighteen compels me to ask. Is your mother Jewish? Um, no, but her maiden name is Levi. Um, Do you know about uh, uh, the custom of giving chai? No, but I will say this about the number 18. It's both of my children's birthdays. And so my birthday is the 13th. Both of my kids are 18th. And so 13 and 18 are my lucky numbers. So my okay. first book has three sections of 13 poems each. And my fourth book has three sections of 18 poems each. I am a very type A um, <laughs> structured human being. And the idea of having um, a book with sections of differing length, maybe the next book I'll let myself like breathe a little easier but I, I really like neatness. Um, you can even see it in like the, the line legs. Like once I've yeah, once yeah. determined the, the mat, the line, it's really hard for me to, to be jagged. I, I'm, I really am orderly on the page. I think that must be why I, I feel like I'm a kindred spirit <laughs> uh, with you. In each of the three sections, there's a poem with the same title, Ohio Cento. Each section also includes a poem whose title follows the structure after the divorce or at the end of the marriage I think of. Are there any other sort of uh, Easter egg uh, titles like that that I've missed? Those are the sections that you had, the, the poems that you had in each section. Yeah, and I've done that in every book I've ever written. I've divided it up and then I've had series of poems or poems that were related and I spread them out. And I don't know what, I just like doing that. I know it's it's funny, someone asked me once like, well, if it's a series of poems, you know that a series by nature is supposed to be together. So it'd be three poems in a row. But I actually, my aesthetic is such that that annoys me. Like I actually like better having a, a little taste of something. And then I love the sort of like Hansel and Gretel breadcrumb trail, the feeling you get of later in a book having that sense of familiarity where there's a kind of poem that you've seen before and you can be like, oh, I know what that is. And I think you miss out on that, that ability to pattern something and have that sense of familiarity when you compress like things together. So my, my way with every one of my books and people go back, they'll be like, oh, she's been doing this since the beginning of time is I have these different poems and conversation and I, I place them far apart so that they can kind of yell across yeah. a canyon to each other. Right. And I like that better. I love that. I love that answer. Well, good. Um, we have come to the time where I want you to read the poem, Goldenrod. Okay, I can find that. And I've got, a, I've got a bunch of questions. It's second in the book, if you <laughs> needed me to tell you. Ladies and gentlemen, Maggie Smith reading Goldenrod. Goldenrod, I'm no botanist, 
If you're the color of sulfur and growing at the roadside, you're goldenrod. You don't care what I call you, whatever you were born as. You don't know your own name. But driving near Peoria, the sky pink orange, the sun bobbing at the horizon, I see everything is what it is exactly in spite of the words I use. Black cows, barns falling in on themselves. You, dear flowers born with a highway view, forgive me if I've mistaken you. Goldenrod, whatever your name is, you are with your own kind. Look, the meadow is a mirror full of you, your reflection repeating. Whatever you are, I see you wild yellow and I would let you name me. Wow, you know, because I, perhaps because I'm a spoken word poet, perhaps because I know that poem well, I almost memorized. Um, I don't, I don't follow along. I just watch you perform it. And I heard a line break that um, that I didn't notice before, um, or, or rather, I heard you emphasize a line break. I bet I can guess what it is. I. I don't think you can, but I know what you're going to say. Okay, then what is it? I'm curious. You think I'm going to say, I see everything. I did think you were going to say that. I know that um, because I, uh, I, like, I'm a huge fan and I was almost going to, like, um, pub, you know, print up a big thing and say, why did you break this line here? But I love following your Instagram and you, you like, broke down a poem. Um and said, I, you know, here's why I broke this here. I liked having a, a line that said, I see everything. And I break lines the same way. I want them to say one thing when you read them um, horizontally as lines, but another thing vertically when you read them in the context of a sentence. Yeah. I see everything is what it is, despite uh, what I call it. Uh, no, it was, um, there must be a break after the word born. Because you said, dear flowers, born, no? There isn't. I would have said, Paused. dear flowers, <laughs> dear flowers, born with a roadside view. How do, you, how do you read that line? Dear flowers, born with a highway view. With I do highway. pause there. With a I, I put view. a little sejura, a little pause right in the center of the Is line. Is it right in the middle? All right, then I don't know yeah. what I'm talking about. You know right, let me get to my, my, my actual written down question. You know what? I'm going to tell you what it is. What? It's because there's rhyme. I'm basically, I think what it is, is I'm setting up the rhyme, which you don't see. If you're looking at the poem on the page, you don't see the rhyme. It means you're doing your but job if, right. If you hear it, dear flowers born with a highway view, forgive me if I've mistaken you. You hear the view you, but it's tucked inside. Like it's not actually end rhyme. You mentioned in that same post that rhyme is not usually a, a, a thing you strive for. No. But yeah. this poem has a lot of it, and it actually, sure there are two poems, and it's usually tucked inside, like I kind of origami it in. Um, but you hear it. I, I'm big on assonance, so I'm big on shared vowel sounds, even if it's not a perfect rhyme. Well, we've got. I'm going to be talking about assonance in this next question. All right. Um, I should point out to those who don't have their copies of the book yet that it is dedicated to your parents and to your children who you call the beloveds who named me. Mm -hmm. This poem, perhaps more than any other poem in the book, embodies the theme of celebrating incomplete knowledge. I can just see you driving outside Peoria and thinking, oh, look at the beautiful goldenrod or, you know, whatever. whatever. <laughs> I write a lot of poems about trying to say the right thing, accidentally saying the wrong thing, and then discovering that the wrong thing might actually be the perfect thing, uh, or at least leads you to a deeper understanding. And I think something similar is going on here. Can you tell us the backstory about writing this poem before I have a secondary, incredibly snobby question? <laughs> oh, um, I wrote this poem on a legal pad in my lap from the passenger seat of a car, um, driving back from a poetry reading in um, Champaign, Urbana, um, and um, looked over and saw this field of goldenrod and then realized I actually have no idea what that is. 
And so what does that mean exactly? Like, what does it mean that it is itself and I'm perceiving it and I'm having this relationship with it, but I don't actually know what it is. And it doesn't, it's not perceiving me at all. And it might not know what it's called, but it knows it's among things that are home to it. I mean, and that ended up sort of being the metaphor. Yeah, and it led you to, the, like the not knowing is what led you to a deeper understanding. And that's right. that's that absolutely part of the poem. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't want to read this poem if it began, I'm a botanist, so listen <laughs> to me. Okay, here's, oh, the sno- Goldenrod. here's the snobby question. The first time I read Goldenrod, when I got to the line about driving near Peoria, I started readying myself for the joke about Peoria that then that I thought was about to come, and then it never materialized. And that made me come face to face with my own snobbery. Because for me, and I hope I'm not alone in admitting this, maybe people could mention in the chat, oh yeah, I feel I felt the same way about Peoria. Uh, Peoria is almost synonymous with Podunk, Kalamazoo, and Timbuktu, places so obviously in the middle of nowhere that they might not actually exist. But I suspect you feel more like my friend from Western Nebraska, who says that Peoria is a big city halfway to New York in both size and geography. So my question is this, do you ever change an aspect of a poem if such a change will better serve the larger truth that the poem is trying to excavate? Asked another way, does every detail in a poem need a reason for inclusion other than the fact that it is merely true? Or do you limit yourself to the facts only as they reveal themselves to you? Perhaps thinking, okay, I'm near Peoria, that will work if I describe the field as pink orange. Well, you know, first of all, I know nothing about Peoria. It was just a a word on a sign as I was driving. So it's not a place I've ever been. So I have no actual association with the place. So just as a, just from a word perspective, what a gift, like forget the place. I have no idea what it's like. It could be terrible. It might be beautiful. It probably depends on whether you're from there or not. But the word itself, all those vowels, it's like a gift when you look up and you see Peoria, I mean, it could have just said Bluffton, and then I would have had to come up with something else, which- But would you have, can't you change it? Yes, so what I'm, what, so to answer your second question, I would have probably changed the place if I didn't like the word. I just was given the gift of a beautiful word on a road sign. But what about the centuries worth of baggage that the, that the city of Peoria carries from the vaudeville circuit of people going, but how will it play in Peoria? Basically <laughs> treating Peoria as a bland Midwestern city. And if the vaudeville act works there in Peoria, that doesn't, that didn't enter into it at all. It doesn't at all, but I mean, I have to be really frank. Like I was born in central Ohio and still live there. So, um, you know, that's, that's where I'm from. Like, I am like thoroughly Midwestern. Right. Um, so if, if the vaudeville act worked in my town, it would probably work anywhere. So that's, that's where I'm from. But I mean, to answer your other question about whether I always, um, tell the truth in a poem. No. I mean, sometimes I conflate details or, two different conversations may have happened on two different days. And I, I conflate them into one conversation because for the purposes of the poem, it doesn't really matter. Right. Or there's a third character who was part of the actual event, but right. that third character just gets in the way and we don't really yeah. need him. No. Yeah. So I edit it out. I mean, it's not, it's not a memoir, it's right. poems. Right, good, yeah. good. Um, all right, I'm gonna go into the rocket round of questions. I've got ni- 19 questions. Stop. <laughs> What's that? Really? Yeah, you really but, have? Yes, but you can- but That the, the, so, stop, not like an actual stop, okay. But they are, you can say yes, no, um, a pass. You can pass them if you don't like okay. them, okay? And then I sort of hope you do say pass on some of them. Okay. All right, and then I'm gonna, and there's some, um, there's some other uh, good questions I, um, I'm gonna get to. 
um, rocket round. Feel free to say pass and we will skip to the next one. Okay. One, do you mow your own lawn? Yes. Two, on December 28th of this year, who will, if she survives until then, be celebrating her 87th birthday? Uh, the other Maggie Smith? Correct. <laughs> Number three, is the act of performing a poem out loud part of the revision process for you? Or is a poem totally finished by the time it finally gets read out loud in front of an audience? Um, I don't read in front of an audience as part of revision, but I mutter it to myself and read it out loud alone. And that's how I know when it's done. But when you go to in, in front of an audience, if there's a reaction you didn't know you were going to get, it's, you're not going to go back and change it. No. Okay. Um, four, to celebrate the publication of this book, you got a new tattoo of a stem of goldenrod. Could we see that tattoo, please? And how sure are you that it is actually goldenrod and not an often confused but similar species of the Austra Australis family? It's goldenrod. As, far, as it's, far as you know, as far as you know, that's goldenrod. Okay. I know it's goldenrod. I mean, it's better than like the, the tattoo that's, um, you know, that like people get in college that's in Chinese and then they realize later it means like something that they didn't think that it meant. Right. It's actually goldenrod. Okay, good. All right. Um, number five, do you have any other tattoos that you either cannot show us or wish you didn't get or both? Um, all of mine are on my arms and you can see them all and I regret nothing. Uh, slightly related question. Is recreational marijuana legal in Ohio? <laughs> no. Seven. <laughs> do you have a meditation practice? Uh, no. Uh, I'm going to skip that one then, uh, the next one. Uh, do you think you'll ever get married again? I have no idea. Did Goldenrod, the manuscript, have any other possible titles that you can remember? Or did you always know that it was going to be called Goldenrod? No, it was called Tender Age first. And then I toyed around with it being called Talisman. And mm. then Goldenrod was the, was the winner. It was a Thunderdome. <laughs> and, and three titles entered and one title left what was the first one um tender age was that the first one to get knocked out yep like talisman talisman just took that one out yeah and then and then goldenrod won over over I talisman. Love talisman is good but and, and the bracket down yeah um, I went back and looked at your Instagram feed running up to election day. And besides a Kamala Harris quotation about how she loves to eat no for a bre for breakfast, I love there, that was, quote. there was no obvious demonstration of which way you lean politically, although the wise can always infer. Is that a conscious decision? Oh, um, no, I'm, uh, I'm absolutely as left as the left can get. I don't see that in your. No, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I guess I don't really, I don't talk about it that much. I feel like it's implied. Okay. No, I, <laughs> you know, I, I, can, I can get it. I can get it. Yeah. Um, did you know that on the day that you posted a photo of a metaphor that was rolled either by your daughter, Violet, or your son, Rhett, using the box of metaphor dice that I sent you, I think that it was, um, the past is a petty thunderstorm. Yeah. And I noticed a huge spike in sales of metaphor dice that day. Really? Absolutely. You're welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank <laughs> you, a belated thanks. Um, have you ever referred to your children, Violet and Rhett, collectively as Violet? No, um, I call them Vi, Rhett, I call them, um, I call them jackalopes a lot of the times, like, hello, you little jackalopes. Okay, I like you know, that. Like the little jackalope that's like a rabbit with an with antelope antlers. Yeah, no, we watch uh, on, on Disney Plus, my kids and I watch uh, a, a show called, uh, a, a little cartoon called Bounding, and they mention the jackalope in there. Yep, they're jackalopes to me. Rhett Miller, the singer songwriter and seventh generation Texan wrote a very nice blurb for Goldenrod. And I noticed that he the other day hold it, held up the, the book and mentioned it. Is your son Rhett named after Rhett Miller? Yes. 
Uh, number 15. Can you name this song? <clears throat> when they get what they want, will they never want it again? Yes. Violet by Hole. <laughs> Is Violet named after the Courtney Love song? No, Violet's not named after anything. Although I realized later, going back to my very favorite book as a child, The Boxcar Children by Gertrude Chandler Warner, the littlest daughter in that book is named Violet. So I'm, I wonder if it sort of winnowed its way into the oh, back Oh, it absolutely of the did. It yeah. absolutely did. Um, 16, the humor in your poems is so wonderfully subtle and wry that I suspect you haven't spent much time performing your poetry in front of drunk people. <laughs> no, that's probably true. Have you ever competed in a poetry slam? No. Have you ever been to a poetry slam? Um, a proper poetry slam? No. There are two in Columbus. I have never been. I will send you links to, uh, to, the, to uh, the two slams in Columbus. Excellent. Um, number 18. Oh, 18. This is the last one. Um, a quick look at the events page on your website, maggiesmith.com slash events indicates that on Thursday, August 5th, you'll be doing another one of these virtual readings. It will be your ninth virtual reading in the next 10 days. That reading is at 7 p.m. But later that same night, I will be hosting a different online event called Metaphor Die, which is to say where poets and freestyle rappers and stand-up comedians all compete using metaphor dice and swap <laughs> stories about their creative process. Do you really think that sleep is the better option for you after your <laughs> reading? Because I could totally put you in the lineup of my reading. Are you trying to recruit me? Yes. Um, yes. Here, wait, 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 let me... wait, pass, but I'll think about it. Okay. Here's okay. a, here's a roll. Here's a roll of metaphor dice. Happiness is an everyday thunderstorm. I love it. Couldn't you, couldn't you come up with a couple of, how about this? Your ego is an obstinate bird song. Taylor, I can roll the dice. I just don't want to have to think of anything that I have to build off of the roll. I get it. I get it. I, they, they, they make me do it. I'm there. I try to be just the inventor and, and the host, but they make I, me. I mean, I write poems. There are poems in Goldenrod that took me, you know, I started them when Violet was a baby and she's going into seventh grade. I am a, I am a long game runner. I am not a fast a fast creator, unfortunately. It's terrifying. Um, <laughs> I just, I just, uh, I just did one thing. I dropped the link uh, to my to my event on August fifth. Oh, good. Metaphor die, which is to say, uh, and and maybe people will go there after they uh, after they see you. I mean, I will come and watch with the second of the wrapped IPAs that you sent me in the mail, which I'm not even sure is legal. To be. <laughs> Can you send it, beer to someone in the mail? You cannot. You cannot. Okay. You well, cannot. You now and that never happened. This is um, for, he never did that. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna now. I, I have something to do to close. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get a couple of questions in here, and I'm apologize that I haven't. There's a lot of love for good bones in the in the Q and A. Um, God, I love that. You 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 know um, you know because you were part of this. Um, I ordered the broadside the signed broadside. I'm a huge fan of, of broadsides. I just love them as an, as an art form. And the broadside of yours, of, of Good Bones is, is, is beautifully designed. Um, and uh, I, was, I was texting back and forth with, um, there's, a, there's a young woman who recited one of my poems at the national, at the Poetry Out Loud um, co uh, contest. Yeah. Couple, five years ago, they chose one of my poems. I've got uh, a couple from Goldenrod that are in the that are in Poetry Out Loud now. I would say you've Such arrived. I, I would say you've arrived, but you've been quoted by Dr. Jill Biden, and uh, and 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 so you've already arrived. Uh, um, so her, her she she had recited this poem, and I I I just came up with a broadside of the of the poem that she had created. I'm I'm. I'm texting back and forth with her mother. Um, and I say, do you by any chance know the poem, uh, Good Bones by Maggie Smith? And she said, oh my God, that poem is my sacred text. 
she's a teacher and she said i i read it every morning before i go off to to teach for the day and so it it hurt um but i sent her my copy i said like well then i've got a signed copy of the broadside that i think you need uh more than i do and i told you that and you said well then let's send you another one um, so anyway, th th there are a lot of fans of Good Bones, but that that's not in Golden uh, Goldenrod. So I'm not going to um, I'm not going to uh, ask you to uh, read that. But um, there uh, there is a reading request from Stephanie Land who said, "Could you read? Aww. Not everything is a poem. Can you describe what um, what the poem Riding Your Boys Back looks like?" Oh. Do you know Stephanie Land? I do. Okay. Stephanie Land is the author of the terrific memoir, um, Made, M-A-I-D. Um, Somebody drop the link to that in the chat, please. Especially yeah. if it's sold by politics and prose. He's a terrific writer. Uh, so this is not everything is a poem. And the, the title is a run-in. So it just goes right into the first uh, line of the poem. Not everything is a poem or has a poem inside it, but God help me. If I can't find one when I empty my son's pockets before I do the wash. One acorn, two rocks, one smooth and gray, one rough and glittering flecked pink, a chunk of mulch, a wilted dandelion. The poem is there, I think, pressing itself against the grit or splinter or bitter yellow. But I question its mother softness suspicious of flowers and laundry. I swear I've seen poems riding my boy's back as he runs around our weed patch of a lawn, letting crabgrass saw his ankles because killing it would mean killing the wild violets, his sister's namesakes. I don't dare look for poems in spring, even if all the purple and green are on clearance then. Two springs ago, my son was so ill he smelled bad sweet. And one morning he woke shitting blood, saying my name, my name, my name. No poem kept his body from bruising purple that would fade to green, his skin a field of flowers. No, not this poem, and not a poem at all. But he lived. It's spring again and he lives. It's spring again, and his pockets are full of petals and stones. I can barely get through that poem. <laughs> so thank you, Stephanie, for making me read that. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing Hannah is gonna, uh, is gonna stop me in a second, so let me go right into my closing. Um, in closing, I'd like to confess that I often read poems by our friends and contemporaries like Ocean Vong, Nick Flynn, Andrea Gibson, or Denez Smith. And I think to myself, oh, that is good. It's not the kind of poem that I'm trying to write myself, but even I can recognize that that is good. However, that is not the case with you, Maggie Smith because your poems are often exactly the kinds of poems that I am actively trying to write, which means that every poem of yours that I love is also one that I didn't get to write first and now never will. So although sometimes I catch myself thinking, damn you, Maggie Smith, <laughs> it never comes out of my mouth that way. It sounds more like what I think a lot of us watching you tonight feel, having finally found you. In mostly your own words, we say, Maggie Smith, darling, we have waited our whole lives for you. Thank you for joining me tonight. Oh, goodness, thank you so much. What a privilege. Thank you. My pleasure. And now I believe right. Hannah Miller is gonna come back on here and give us the outro. I should point out that the Goldenrod uh, link to buy it at P Politics and Prose has been dropped several times in the chat. You can also buy Made. That link has also been there. Okay. Um, and yeah. thank you so much. And Hannah, take it away while we finish our beers. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do all the hard work. I'm so behind you because you've been 
peppering me with questions and I haven't had time. But I talked so much. You could have drunk more. I, I was. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You can catch up now. Um, thank you all for doing this. It was amazing to watch both of you. It was such a good playlist of poems that you've selected, Taylor. And it was so much fun to hear you read them, Maggie. Thank you so much. Um, also, if you guys want to look up any of those other books that he po pointed out, Ocean, Ocean Vong is brilliant. So many of the other ones are too. So pull them up, look at their works, especially maybe books that you haven't read by them before because they have so many. Um, thank you all for joining. And last question for you, actually, Maggie, because we already heard who Taylor loves, but who is someone else that you love in the writing world? Oh my gosh, I have so many people I love in the writing world. Um, the stuff that I've been, the books that I've just um, finished, Kate Bear's new book, which is due out in November. I just finished The Galley and it's incredible poems. And um, Danielle Henderson's memoir, The Ugly Cry, just finished okay. that and absolutely loved it. Like laughed, cried, um, you know, hell yes, my way through that book. It's so terrific. So I, I highly recommend both of those. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. And everyone else, thank you for joining. Have such a good night and hopefully it won't storm like it did a couple of days ago in DC. Thank you all. <laughs> Bye.